So I don't know if you up there, you want to, to, to do that to see if we, can, if we can hear you. We don't hear anything, but we, you, we, know, you, we know you're there. Thank you very much for being here. Um, uh, welcome again. I saw many of you on Monday already. I hope you survived the first uh, pre-rentrée pre week. Uh, at least you seem to have. It's a pleasure, it's always uh, a humbling pleasure to welcome you all at this uh, so special session because the lecture de rentrée solennelle is really a key event for you. That's something you will remember. And that's also a marker for us. That's something that we, we, we choose to be very consistent with what we represent as a school, what our values are, but also consistent with what, what you will be learning all through, all through the year. Um, so welcome to you all. You are representing 74 nationalities. Uh, there are 60% of you are women. Uh, I don't have all the diversity uh, 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 data, but I can tell you that you're very diverse and that's a pride we have. Uh, that's a th strength for you um, for, for the year to come to be, uh, to be uh, feeding your discussions, to feed your uh, intellectual formation, learning all through the year. So diversity is really the first topic I want to, ha to highlight because this is something that uh, not only you are proud of, but that is something that will uh, bring the quality of who you will be when you uh, exit the school and you enter the labor market and make, make the most out of it. Um, the second word, I don't want to be long and I've been given one minute and a half, so I just have three key words, diversity, universalism, uh, make use of this diversity to be developing tolerance, uh, to give value to this universalism that has been uh, with the spirit of Sciences Po since the very beginning. Florent uh, Bonaventure was mentioning it on Monday. So Florent, you don't listen to me. I see you're speaking with your neighbor. Uh, but this is also something that is very key at the moment with all the shocks that are ongoing in the, in the global uh, economy on, on, on the global political and geopolitical scene. Uh, so keep that in mind and keep that in your heart as well as, and that will be my third word, uh, humanism. Humanism, uh, uh, again, that was something that was with the blood of Sciences Po ever since it was created, and, and our director will, will take the word right after me uh, to, 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 to dwell on this and introduce our, our keynote speaker uh, tonight. Um, you are here in the business school of Sciences Po. I'm glad I've, I've got the authorization by our director to name the School of Management and Impact the business school of Sciences Po, which was not the case five years ago, but we've evolved. And re we really mean to give you uh, an education in which uh, you believe in capitalism, you believe in the way we produce collectively value, but you also are able to understand and put a critical view on what capitalism is, to understand that there are many forms of capitalism all through history, but also uh, on a cross from a cross-sectional perspective as seen from today. And France has been very at the front uh, um, seat in terms of developing the legal frameworks to have a system of uh, capitalism based on firms, but based on, based on firms that can have something else in mind than uh, the sheer uh, shareholder value. Uh, I'm sure that will be the topic of the speech today, so I don't want to say more on this, uh, but expanding this definition of value beyond the metric of, of uh, shareholder, uh, the, the, the unique you know, stakeholder being the shareholder, uh, is something that is very dear to us. That's something that you, you will learn in the, in, in the courses that, we, that you will uh, have in all the masters, the not only in the finance masters, but also in the masters of communication, human resources, uh, marketing. This is something you will learn about. Um, and another dimension that is key to us, and this is something that is very difficult to define as I, as I, I mean, I, I, I see that as, as, as time passes, is that we want to put the long term at the center of your compass. We are all busy with our daily lives. You've been busy finding a, a, a room in Paris, you know, finding your ways here, being in touch with the administration, being in touch with your uh, uh, responsable pedagogic and so on. Uh, you will be busy looking at your, you know, your, your midterm exams and your final exams at Christmas. So you, you will be le nez dans le guidon for many reasons, but please keep in mind always uh, that, that everything you learn here is really for your long term, for the long term of the economy, 
and for those who come after you. And I tell you, life you know, goes by very, very fast. So having said that, um, I give the floor to our director, Matthias Vichra, who will uh, welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, whom I, I thank very dearly for coming over to speak uh, with you and interact with you. There will be a, a Q&A session, I believe, at the end of, uh, of, of, of the speech. So please feel free to, to interact and, uh, and, uh, and use that an, as an opportunity. Thank you very much and welcome. Est-ce que ça va Je vous rappelle qu'à Sciences Po, il y a de l'ambiance. Les étudiants de Sciences Po, les étudiantes de Sciences Po sont dynamiques. Est-ce que ça va oui. Voilà. Merci. Je suis très heureux. Je finis ma semaine de rentrée euh, solennelle avec vous. Et je suis très heureux à un double titre. D'abord, évidemment, parce que l'école du management et de l'impact a une place très chère dans mon cœur. Vous avez une place très chère dans mon cœur. Mais aussi parce que nous accueillons Emmanuel Faber et j'aurai l'occasion d'y revenir. Cher Emmanuel, Madame la Présidente de la Fondation Nationale des Sciences Politiques, chère Laurence, Madame la Doyenne, chère Natacha, Monsieur le Directeur Exécutif, cher Florent, Madame la Directrice Adjointe de la Formation et de la Recherche, chère Anne Solène, et surtout, et surtout, chères étudiantes, chers étudiants. C'est pour moi un vrai, vrai plaisir de vous accueillir dans cet amphithéâtre voûtu, mais aussi en chapsal, j'ai une pensée pour nos amis au-dessus, car vous êtes 497 étudiantes et étudiants à rejoindre cette nouvelle promotion de l'école du management et de l'impact. Vous avez été sélectionné avec soin, donc vous pouvez être fier de vous. Bravo, félicitations, parce que la sélection était rude. Et donc, c'est euh, un premier élément de satisfaction. Un mot, s'il vous plaît, sur l'école du management et de l'impact dans laquelle vous allez faire vos premiers pas. Vous entrez, Natacha l'a dit, dans une business school, ce n'est pas un gros mot, mais dans une business school réellement particulière. Car à la fois, nous avons une approche professionnalisante, vous aurez toutes les techniques pour faire euh, de la stratégie, euh, toutes les techniques d'une business school classique, et en plus, et en plus un supplément d'âme autour d'une approche interdisciplinaire des sciences humaines et sociales. Et Emmanuel peut, euh, pourra le confirmer, et je peux vous le dire, pour avoir eu une courte expérience en entreprise, où que vous soyez, le fait d'avoir une connaissance en droit, en histoire, en sciences politiques, en sociologie, ce n'est pas simplement ornemental, c'est un élément déterminant, déterminant de la, votre valeur professionnelle. Et d'ailleurs, la valeur professionnelle des étudiants de l'EMI et de Sciences Po en général, mais des étudiants de l'EMI en particulier, augmente année après année. Près de 90% trouvent un emploi dans les moins de six mois, c'est plus de 8 points de plus en un an. En un an. Donc vous entrez dans une école particulière où nous entendons former des managers à la fois d'un haut niveau technique et capables de penser les responsabilités sociales, environnementales de l'entreprise avec un impératif moral mais aussi un prérequis professionnel, être formé aux transformations environnementales et numériques. Cela repose sur cinq piliers, un modèle de formation unique alliant sciences sociales et enseignement technique, je vous l'ai dit, une assise sur l'excellence de la recherche académique et appliquée, nous mêlons la recherche et l'enseignement. Une place centrale accordée aux perspectives transdisciplinaires. Alors juste un mot là-dessus, parce qu'il y a 20 ans, quand j'étais étudiant, on parlait de sciences pipo. C'est-à-dire, en gros, vous êtes spécialiste de rien, donc, en gros, sciences po, c'est du pipo. La réalité de la complexité du monde dans lequel nous sommes, c'est que mêler les disciplines, les combiner, c'est au contraire une vraie valeur. Et quand Émile Bikini a créé Sciences Po il y a maintenant 151 ans euh, sur les cendres et les ruines de la guerre franco-prusse, il avait déjà cette intuition de l'interdisciplinarité. Et nous perpétuons cet héritage en élargissant, j'allais dire, le spectre, en continuant l'interdisciplinarité de manière renforcée. Quatrièmement, une orientation intellectuelle autour des enjeux du bien commun, de l'impact et de numérique. Et enfin, un rôle majeur accordé à la création, aux arts et à l'innovation, parce que nous pensons à Sciences Po qu'il y a un dialogue fécond entre les sciences humaines et sociales et les arts. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, avec Laurence Bertrand d'Orléac, nous avons créé une maison des arts et de la création. Nous accueillons des artistes en résidence dans le domaine du cinéma, dans le domaine de la littérature, dans le domaine euh, de la danse, de la musique et aussi des arts plastiques, parce que nous pensons qu'il y a un dialogue fécond 
et vous verrez que nous avons raison de penser à cette fécondité. À ma demande et dans le prolongement du changement de nom, vous savez, l'ENI s'appelait encore il y a un an l'école du management et de l'innovation. Nous l'avons désormais dénommée l'école du management et de l'impact. Vous aurez toute une série de novations pédagogiques et de changements de maquettes. Il y a un cours commun, notamment autour des sciences sociales, de l'impact environnemental et social, des cours spécifiques sur la mesure d'impact, le bilan carbone, la finance durable, l'extra-financier, Emmanuel pourra vous en reparler, qui sont encore une fois pas du tout ornementales, mais qui sont vraiment une dimension essentielle avec en plus une attractivité et des perspectives professionnelles importantes. Nous avons aussi créé un impact studio ainsi qu'une chaire autour de la transformation des organisations et du travail. À Sciences Po, il y a une autre tendance qui est intéressante, c'est que vous êtes de plus en plus, à la sortie de l'ENI, à créer votre entreprise. Ça, c'est assez nouveau. Vous savez qu'en sortant de Sciences Po, 70% vont dans le privé et 5% créent leur entreprise. C'est une tendance que nous souhaitons accompagner, renforcer, et notamment, dans les trois ans, 70% de l'ensemble des étudiants de Sciences Po, pas seulement de l'ENI, auront eu un cours, au moins un cours, sur l'entrepreneuriat. L'ENI, ce sont aussi huit doubles diplômes, avec 74 nationalités représentées, 74, c'est un petit monde en miniature, et d'une certaine manière, nous pensons que le corps social étudiant doit vivre dans sa diversité, dans sa différence. C'est l'homogénéité, c'est l'endogamie, c'est l'entre-soi qui ne permet pas d'atteindre l'excellence. Nous, nous pensons qu'au contraire, c'est dans l'ouverture sociale, l'ouverture géographique, l'ouverture internationale que réside la possibilité de l'excellence. Et on est très fiers à Sciences Po, par exemple, de conjuguer une amélioration de l'excellence, par exemple pour les élèves français, 97% de mention très bien au bac, et en même temps d'augmenter le taux de boursier, puisque nous avons 30% de boursiers, il n'y a pas une grande école en France qui a 30% de boursiers. Vous serez accompagné sur votre chemin par une équipe pédagogique formidable, avec votre doyenne, Natacha Valla, avec votre directeur exécutif, Florent Bonaventure, avec toutes les équipes pédagogiques que je vous propose d'accueillir, et aussi, évidemment, d'applaudir d'ores et déjà. Profitez-en, ce sont vos dernières heures de tranquillité, puisqu'à partir de lundi, ça commence sérieusement. Vous allez beaucoup travailler. Ça, je vous rassure, vous allez beaucoup travailler. Mais si on se pose, ce ne sont pas que des études, c'est aussi une expérience. Profitez des conférences, profitez des associations culturelles, artistiques, profitez des grandes conférences. On a quand même eu ces dernières semaines Angela Merkel, qui est venue ici recevoir un doctorat honoris causa, le secrétaire général de l'ONU, quand le président Zelensky a voulu s'adresser pour la première fois devant des étudiants dans le monde, il a choisi Sciences Po pour s'adresser pour la première fois devant des étudiants. Bref, vous allez avoir la possibilité de beaucoup de rencontres, de beaucoup d'expériences et de beaucoup de grandes conférences. Donc faites cela parce que Sciences Po, ce ne sont pas que des études. Alors maintenant, j'en viens à notre invité. Et vous dire que ma joie ce soir réside aussi dans le fait de renouer avec euh, ce que nous avions initié ensemble avec Emmanuel il y a plusieurs années, puisque j'ai eu la chance de travailler auprès d'Emmanuel Faber quand il était euh, PDG de Danone, et moi euh, son secrétaire général. Et je voudrais dire quelques éléments à la fois euh, personnels et, et, et plus professionnels sur sa trajectoire et vous dire en fait à quel point vous avez de la chance ce soir de l'avoir comme grand témoin. Je ne serai pas trop long parce que c'est lui qu'on veut écouter. D'abord vous raconter que lors de notre entretien, de mon entretien d'embauche, à 7h du matin, un samedi, dans un café place de Clichy, nous avons parlé de beaucoup de choses, d'économie évidemment, mais aussi de paléontologie, aussi de musique baroque, en passant évidemment par Danone. Mais c'est pour vous dire que vous avez ici quelqu'un qui n'a pas de hier, qui est justement dans une approche de la complexité et dans une approche plurielle des réalités. Avec euh, Emmanuel, nous avons tenté, alors moi, euh, seulement quelques années, mais lui, euh, pendant plus d'une décennie, par petites touches, de faire bifurquer une certaine forme de capitalisme. Danone, par exemple, a été la première entreprise, et la seule à ce jour, la première entreprise multinationale, à devenir certifiée Bicorp. Danone est la première et la seule entreprise du CAC 40 à ce jour à être devenue société à mission. Tout ça sous l'impulsion d'Emmanuel. Danone a lancé aussi deux grandes coalitions à l'ONU, rassemblant euh, plus d'une quarantaine d'entreprises, Business for Inclusive Growth, sur la croissance inclusive, avec des projets euh, rassemblant plusieurs milliards d'euros, 
et One Planet Business for Biodiversity sur la perte de biodiversité, parce que la perte de biodiversité, ce n'est pas simplement la biodiversité animale, c'est aussi la biodiversité végétale. Et j'ai appris, d'ailleurs, je vous le partage aujourd'hui, une statistique très inquiétante sur 5000 espèces consommables, c'est la FAO qui le dit, il y en a 7 qui représentent 70% de notre alimentation. Donc la biodiversité et le risque et le péril de la biodiversité résident aussi dans nos assiettes. Moi, j'ai gardé beaucoup de choses d'Emmanuel, il va vous dire beaucoup plus de choses que cela, mais notamment une phrase qui m'a beaucoup marqué, qui est très simple et qui, je trouve, résume aussi l'ambition de l'école du management et de l'impact. Emmanuel, tu disais, la finance doit servir l'économie et l'économie doit servir la société. C'est simple, c'est limpide, et pourtant, et pourtant, on est quand même loin du compte. Vous avez, chers étudiants, devant vous un être rare, doublé d'un alpiniste hors pair. Un être rare parce que il incarne une vraie cohérence entre ce que l'on est et ce que l'on dit, entre ce que l'on fait et ses valeurs. Et si j'ai un conseil à mon âge avancé à vous donner, c'est que la recherche de cet alignement, c'est ce qui vous permettra d'être heureux, d'être aligné entre votre occupation professionnelle, vos, vos missions et vos valeurs. Il a par exemple été le seul patron du CAC 40 à rendre sa retraite chapeau. Le seul, le premier et le seul. Il a aussi, il ne l'a jamais dit, mais je le dis, pendant plus de dix ans, reversé 93% de son salaire, 93% de son salaire, à des actions de solidarité dans un fonds de dotation, le fonds des bois, pour lutter contre la pauvreté, pour toute une série de projets solidaires. Il a enfin, quand il est parti de chez Danone, refusé toute forme de gratification financière. Et ça, et ça, en termes de cohérence, je trouve que c'est effectivement admirable. Et puis, il y a, cher Emmanuel, pardonne-moi de te dire les choses comme ça, mais auprès de toi, on grandit. Cette intelligence hors norme faite de fulgurance et de chemin de traverse, qui aujourd'hui sert une cause noble, difficile, ardue, les normes extra-financières. On peut penser que la finance, on peut penser ce qu'on veut de la finance. La réalité, c'est que si on veut changer le monde, et notamment dans un sens écologique, avec de l'impact, il faut, il faut passer par la finance. Il faut soulever le capot de la voiture et mettre les mains dans le cambouis. Et c'est ce qu'Emmanuel fait tous les jours. C'est une charge herculéenne à la mesure de ton énergie. Alors évidemment, pour reprendre un vocabulaire d'escalade, de, il y aura des chiquettes, des châtaignes, mais aussi des cheminots. Mais je sais que, au fond, tu vas poursuivre cette mission avec une, un ligne, une ligne rouge, un fil conducteur, ton engagement et ton alignement. Mes chers amis, chers étudiants, il est des hommes et des femmes qui traversent votre vie sans laisser de traces. Et puis, il en est d'autres qui nous marquent pour toujours. Emmanuel, pour moi, tu es de cela. Et je sais qu'à travers ton propos, à travers ce que tu vas dire à nos étudiants, tu donneras des raisons de ne pas céder au temps avare, au silence résigné. J'ai en tête d'ailleurs une de tes déclarations qui va résonner pour les étudiants que tu as devant toi. Le pouvoir n'a de sens que si vous vous en servez pour rendre service. Cela fait écho à ce que nous sommes, nous, à Sciences Po, une école du pouvoir peut-être, mais du pouvoir non pas sur les êtres et les choses, mais du pouvoir de faire bouger les lignes avec le monde comme horizon. Je vous remercie. Bon, bah après ça, il n'y a plus qu'à. Euh, Est-ce que tout le monde comprend le français Non Est-ce que tout le monde comprend l'anglais bon. euh, Je vais essayer de mixer, alors. Merci pour le... Euh, 
je vous propose qu'on dia qu dialogue. Et puis avant ça, je vais vous dire quelques, quelques mots pour euh, peut-être euh, construire notre conversation. Euh, et peut-être le plus simple pour moi, c'est de m'appuyer pour cette euh, première euh, partie sur euh, ce qui définit même le nom de l'école, École de Management et de l'Impact, euh, School of Management and Impact. Euh, en commençant par euh, ce que j'ai retenu, vous ne l'avez peut-être pas fait vous, mais moi, je, on m'a donné un brief. Il y a trois C euh, qui euh, sont fondamentaux dans l'enseignement que vous allez euh, recevoir ici, euh, dans les expériences que vous allez vivre. Celui de la complexité, celui de la, de la créativité et celui du bien commun, common good en anglais. So I'll start with the, with the school and these three C's. And let me tell you that um, I will add immediately one, the C of climate, for a reason that maybe in a few minutes you, you will understand better. Let me maybe ask one thing. Do you believe that climate is changing? Raise your hand. Well, quite a lot. I don't see the rest of the rooms, but Do you believe that we have a responsibility in this? Okay. So now follow this because I hope that it can help you. We didn't know when I was young that climate was going to change. We didn't know that we had a responsibility. We didn't know companies had a responsibility. It took me until 2005, only not even 20 years ago, I was uh, 40, to realize that um, the activity of Danone had an impact on climate and that we could turn that through regenerative agriculture and many other things. You know that, so you start ahead of the curve, but the curve is going to be shorter. And climate is going to change everything. And that's why I think it's important that you realize this as you enter into this program. The, the first, uh, probably, or the most famous, to me at least, uh, academic about corporate strategy is a guy called Michael Porter. He's a teacher at Harvard. He published in the early 80s a book called The Competitive Advantage. Um, and he added a few years after a book called The Competitive Advantage of Nations. And he was describing how strategy works, how some industries are profitable, others are less, how some are risky, others are less, and how the risks and the return would work together. Beautiful thinking, linear thinking. BCG, Bain, McKinsey, all of these guys have built on Porter. I have at Bain and later on. In the meantime, Porter were very clear, was very clear in the competitive advantage of nations that the geography of nations had a critical role to play in their competitiveness. Yet this was the early 80s and globalization really started big time, into Asia, into Eastern Europe, Russia, Danone in Moscow, McDonald's in Shanghai, um, consumption patterns basically standardizing all over the place, system standardizing, global supply chains, global management, English being spoken as the globish of management all over the place, with poor English as I deliver today. So that was a moment where we were thinking at the end of the day, that's going to be a planet village. We'll all be you know, inhabitants of that, and that would be peace because consumption will be there. Middle class would uh, further democracies and votes, and that would be a good thing. Uh, during all of that moment, already geography was there. Climate was there. When China in 1991, Deng Xiaoping, decided to convert to capitalism, they did one very clever thing. They started to be not the field of the world, but the factory of the world. 
One of the reasons why they did that is because the Chinese territory is scarce in water. And you only need, when you export uh, value added, which is from manufacturing, you need only 50 times less water than when you produce agricultural feed. So by acquiring from outside China rice, grain, soy, porks, and others, and export bits and pieces of engine, chips, and all these technologies, China is actually importing virtual water. And it's a very wise choice that was made by the government 30 years ago. In the meantime and before climate change, there were areas where the growth of population was starting to create issues about water. Chennai is a six million inhabitants city in, uh, in, uh, in India, where you have what they call day zeros, days where there is no water on the tap in a six million inhabitant cities for weeks. Dead people, riots in the streets, and the municipality has to go and fetch for water in the agricultural areas 300 kilometers from there and you know, get the water back by train. And then comes, say, 2021, and a guy called Tim Marshall, a journalist, a US uh, economist and journalist, uh, writes a book called Prisoners of Geographies. I would really recommend that you read that book. It basically says, despite all of what we had meant with globalization, the standardization, et cetera, et cetera, we are prisoners of geographies. We are prisoners of where we are based. And why am I telling you this? Because climate change is going to be critical on this. If you ever want to have a responsibility in microeconomics management, in macroeconomics policy making, you need to understand that. Even before climate starts really to change, right now, only a few points of a degree of temperature change, already now, if I continue on water, um, the Colorado River is so much overused in the US that when it crosses the border of Mexico in Arizona, it has to be desalinated. And then it goes to Mexico and it doesn't even find the Gulf of California. It dies before reaching the, the, the ocean. That's happening now. You have probably, if you are in Europe or from Europe, you have probably seen that this summer and previous summer, the heat waves caused the nuclear powers uh, to shut down because the temperature of rivers to cool them off is too high. Who would have thought even five years ago, that the capacity of France to produce electricity was going to be linked to only a heat wave in summertime. My current office is in Frankfurt, not so far from the Rhine River. The Rhine River is the biggest volume-wise uh, river in Europe, carrying a lot of goods in and out Europe. For the second uh, year in a row, this summer, the Rhine River was so low because of the droughts, because glaciers do not produce enough water anymore for uh, ensuring the stability of the water flow. The traffic had to be interrupted for several weeks. Uh, the size of the boats had to be divided by three, and that created disruptions in all supply chains across Europe and in the Rotterdam port for exports and imports. The Panama Canal, uh, an incredible construction that avoids for six or 10% of the global maritime traffic to go around South America and the Cap Horn to reach and cross uh, Atlantic Ocean and Pacific. They use fresh water to get the boats at the right level. The amount that you need of water for one boat is 200 million liters. 50 boats every day, that's 10 billion, which is the equivalent of the France consumption every day of tap water. They lack water for the second year in a row now. There are droughts. Uh, they don't know where exactly their reserves of fresh water are. Result is they have slowed down the traffic. You have traffic jams from the Pacific to the ocean. And they are losing money. Why am I telling you all of this? Is because climate change 
is not in 30 years, it's now. It is now. And what I described to you is before it really starts to be serious. Only 0 0.3, 0 0.5. What we expect, as you know, is probably by the end of this century, somewhere 10 to 20 times this increase. So with that, a CEO or a policymaker 50 years ago, 30 years ago, wouldn't have cared much about where to f bring a factory, create a factory. Today, you'd better check twice whether you have ability to have water and enough water to share with the community. And what is going to be the price of water if there is not water enough? And the result on economics is that if you build a factory and then there is a lack of water, you have to cap your production. There is a very simple thing that you may learn during this few years here, which is in accounting, you have to do an impairment. You were amortizing this factory for 30 years. Finally, you can use it only 10 years. Well, you have to accelerate the amortization. That's a loss. So climate change will have very soon impacts on the management. And that turns me to uh, the second part of the conversation, which is management. The function, the economic function of climate change will be to radically change competitive advantages. For humankind, it's a risk. For us collectively, it is a risk. For a company, it might be an opportunity. There are many companies that of course in the short term would thrive. You know, AC, air conditioning, uh, air conditioning companies would thrive in a heat wave, of course. Companies that sell water, if they have a reserve, probably can increase prices. They can see that as an opportunity. But everything I described to you earlier are risks. And facing a risk if you are a company, it's like this story, you know, of these two friends that are walking in the, walking in the forest and um, it's very hot. They stop by a meadow there and uh, there is a, a flow of water and they take their, shorts, uh, their shoes off, cooling, cool, cooling their feet there. And then suddenly a bear comes and they start running, taking their, their, their uh, sport shoes. One of them then stops and start putting the shoes on. And his friend says, well, you can't outrun a bear. Uh, so, you know, don't bother and take time to put your shoes on. Just run, run, run as fast as possible. And the guy says, no, I don't need to outrun the bear. I need to outrun you. Well, this is competitive advantage. You might like it or not. That might be very greedy, but that's what it is about. So a company that will have a climate resilience plan, a strategic climate resilience plan that is better than its competitor will win. That's as simple as that. And I can, I'm ready to bet with any of you that there will not be a more global disruption to the notion of competitive advantage than climate change in the next 20 years. As Matthias said, it hurts also biodiversity in many ways. It hurts water, it hurts deforestation, it hurts temperatures, it hurts the whole business model on which our economies have been built and we are not prepared. There will be tension, tensions to manage this uh, uh, situation. Basically three tensions. The first is the tension between the short and the long term. Of course, if you think about making money for the next uh, months, you probably don't need to think about uh, the resilience of your model. But if you put a factory somewhere, if you build a city somewhere, probably you want to know how it's going to be in 20 years, in 50 years, the resilience of cities all over the place and the economics of that resilience. So that tension between what is efficient and what we call efficiency and what is resiliency in the long term, which for me is part of the new efficiency, is going to surface big time. That's the first tension. The second tension is in space between here 
and somewhere else. Because climate change will hurt the supply chains, the value chains of companies, um, if emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, are to be uh, reduced in Europe, and I am a company which exports to Europe uh, cars, for instance. Well, in my scope three, for those of you who are passionate about that, you, you, you learn soon what it is about, but my indirect emissions that are in Europe, they would need to be cut, otherwise I won't have a business. There is quite often this topic as well on the social issues. How do I manage the compensation of my own workforce and the compensation of the workforce of my suppliers alongside the chain. In the food system, it's a huge topic. Of course, if you're part of Danone in France, you have great uh, wages. There is an incredibly advanced social policy. You know, wages are on average 25, 30%, 40% above market for employees and, and factory workers. But what happens in the fields in Ukraine? in Russia, in Kenya, in Morocco, how much are they making there? So how true are we in looking at the ecosystemic reality of the company beyond its share remit? That tension is going to be there for a simple reason. There cannot be a climate transition without a social transition. It will not be sustainable if not. You just take in France, the yellow jacket crisis, which shows very quickly that if there is not a perception that this transition is going to be uh, fair, democracies won't be able to put them in place. Companies will not be able to put them in place. So that notion of supply chains, value chains, and how the value is moving uh, from one part of the value chain of the company to another is going to be critical to manage. So time horizons, space horizons. And the last one is the one I just mentioned, the tension between social and climate. Climate, you want to be, go big, fast, reduce emissions. Well, yes and but. Um, not everyone is emitting the same amount of carbon. Not everyone. Huh? And again, both as a manager in a microeconomic actor, a bank, an insurance company, a company, uh, or doing policy, following Sciences Po, um, or in an NGO, you will be confronted with the question of something which is called the just transition, la transition juste. The just transition is uh, based on the concept that was agreed at the Paris Agreement of COP21 in, in Paris in 2015. That concept of common but differentiated responsibilities. Our responsibilities in this room are common about climate. We just have one planet. And the emissions are going to impact the temperature all around the planet. Not the same way, but it will. Common responsibilities. Differentiated responsibilities because some of our countries have been there emitting for 200 uh, years. You know, the UK started its revolution 200 years ago and it started with coal. So there is a lot of emissions in the air that are simply due to how um, the UK, Grande Bretagne, started their revolution 200 years ago. The US, of course, Europe, of course, beyond the UK. But Africa is nowhere else. There are still many, many countries in Africa where emissions are extremely low. China is a huge emitter today, but wasn't 50 years ago. So what is going to be the equation through which we find a common path, recognizing those differentiated responsibilities? There are many in the COPs at the UN that are asking, shouldn't the countries that have been emitting the most, like you take historically since the early days of the uh, Industrial Revolution, 
the US have probably about 29 to 30% of total emissions. So shouldn't they take the bigger share of the reduction in the future? Because they are the people that have most benefited from those emissions in their development, in their GDP per capita, their income per inhabitant. They are a rich country because they started this 150 years ago. The UK should, Europe, why not? Now China, which has become so big, probably 20% of cumulated emissions already. Africa is only 3%, of which South Africa is one. 40 countries of Africa have, since the early days of the industrial revolutions, emitted less than 1% of total emissions. So you cannot go to Africa and tell them you need to reduce your emissions. It doesn't work, of course. There is a bit of a less radical conversation, which is also going on at the UN uh, in, in these global conversations that we are having, which is, um, well, maybe not about the history of emissions, but the current emissions. The reasoning is exactly the same. Of course, it's a little bit less uh, 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 differentiated responsibilities uh, because today you have a different picture. Asia is about 18 percent, sorry, 18 billion tons out of the 40 billion tons uh, that are uh, emitted every year of greenhouse gas emissions. The US is about six, Europe is about four, but again, Africa is less than half, a, half point five. So the same reasoning would go if you take today's emissions. The just transition is going to be fundamental because countries that have not benefited from uh, the growth that today are making the rich countries rich, those countries are poor, they do not emit, they don't want, they cannot have their emissions going down. So it means the reduction of emissions is going to be overloaded on this country where we are and a number of the richer countries. That is what is called climate justice. It's easy to describe, super complicated to do. I will add one point on this, as we are at Sciences Po Politique. This reasoning works within countries. It's not only the question of inequalities uh, between countries. It's also within a country. Take the example of France. France, depending on how you count the emissions, we have anywhere between seven and nine, ten tons per capita. That's the average, average. If we want to be uh, in 2030 in France compliant with the EU policy, which is called Fit for 55, cutting 55% of emissions in the EU compared to 2015, 1995, sorry, uh, it means by 30, by 2030, it means we need to cut very quickly uh, in the next several years down to five in France. From seven, eight, nine, ten, down to five. That is the average today in France. 50% of the population emit less than five. So the median. It means in this room, half of you are already at five. Do you think it would be fair if we decided that you need to cut from five to three, and you guys who are probably at 11, you need to cut from 11 to, I don't know, seven or eight? No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. The way it works is that you tell those 50% of French people that are at five, good news, you're at five, you can stay at five. The government, the companies, the economy will change. We will decarbonize your way of living because we will invest in infrastructure, in public transportation, in renovation of uh, very uh, low quality and high energy uh, 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 emittive uh, housing in which you live because you have a limited income. So not only you will stay at five, but your standard of living is going to increase, by the way. 
because we invest and your quality of life will be better in 10 years. That probably works for this part. Seems fair. But then what happens with the rest of the population? The guys like me who travel, etc., etc. What do I do? Do I cut my emissions by 80%? And who is going to decide that? Do you think that the elite who decides, the economic elite, the political elite, the academic elite, are they going to be ready to recommend that we vote something that says, you guys, you need to do three times more than these guys who are already at five. They won't even do anything. They are where we should be in 10 years. Again, common but differentiated responsibilities. When I speak about tensions, I think you, make, you get the point here. That's not going to be easy. So, the first thing we need, of course, is policies at the local level, municipalities, regions, jurisdictions, countries, global, that are driving the trajectories for uh, a climate and a social transition, no doubt. COP21 has done something, we can, you know, their continuation, it's difficult, but those policies are essential. So Canada today has a very strong decarbonation plan. Europe has a very strong decarbonation plan. Japan starts one. Many, many countries start really serious policies that are going to be in their regulation, in their laws. The UK, by the way, the US has one, believe it or not. And which is not ridiculous. I mean, they are acting super fast, much more pragmatically than we do. So, first thing is public policy. But the government doesn't have feet, doesn't have arms, hands. They're not doing. The people that are going to make the transition is the economy. The companies, the private sector, of course, the public sector, which is 10 to 30 percent of GDP, depending of countries, of course, they are going to be there. But the bulk of the effort will be the transformation of economy. The management, you are managers, you are going to be managers, the management of that transformation in companies, creating the transition plans, the resilience, the climate resilience plans for the economies and therefore for the countries where they operate. And there will be incentive, taxes, sticks, carrots, whatever it takes to guide uh, the economies in that direction. But to do this, you need money. That's an investment to start with. And this is where the role of finance is going to be so critical. And this is why we need you in finance. We need you in business. As Matthias said earlier, finance is here to serve economies, business, and business is here to serve society. So the role of finance, whether we like it or not, is fundamental. It will never disappear. You want to call it something else, call it something else if you want, but it will be finance. Basically, what the capital markets are doing is recycling the excess money that has been produced and that is ready to be in reinvested somewhere else. That's what they do. That is the basis of any economy. Any. Can be very simple in your home and you put uh, your bank is your sock, you know, dans les bad laines, your sock under the pillow and that's where you put your money. Or it can be Citibank or Goldman Sachs or BlackRock or whatever hedge funds. But that's the same system. It's a more complex system, but that's the same. It's absolutely essential. Savings, investments, recycling uh, the excess of capital that is going to be useful somewhere else. Because if there was not that, there would not be an ability to develop. It's like suppressing trade. It's the trade of money. Now today, finance cannot support business into the transition for a simple reason. The reason that they don't have the language. The accounting today is not capturing everything that I just said. We count a lot of things, but we do not count everything that counts. In the GDP, you probably know that there is no value for oil. The oil, as it is extracted and as it uh, took 55 million years for Earth to produce, has no value, zero. What you have in the PL of Total and others, in the profit and loss accounts and the statements, is the cost of research, extracting, transforming, 
uh, transporting, refining, distributing, selling. That's the cost. That is what you have. And then the government taxes on oil. The value of oil is zero, zero, zero. Regenerative agriculture. 70% of soils are degraded in the US. A soil which is degraded, in 20 years you cannot farm on it. It's about 30% in Europe. There is absolutely no value nowhere in any agricultural firm for the depreciation of the soil. This is why when Matthias and myself were at Danone, we created a scheme that was, we published our profit adjusted with the carbon emissions value cost of our agriculture. And we were saying, well, we cannot return dividends beyond that number because we need first to reinvest in order to make sure that there is going to be regenerative agriculture, soil health will improve in 20 years from now. That is regenerative economics. That does not exist. I did that outside of accounting. It was a non-IFRS uh, uh, accounting system. They were okay with that. We had lots of blessing, but this is just a pilot. Big agricultural firms or bioscience firms. It is uh, in nature very close to the fields because you have the same species than the ones that are cultivated in the field, but there are wild varieties of those. And they mutate and they adapt to climate change, those ones. So the biggest, probably the biggest lab that we have, the biggest wealth of solutions for climate change in terms of agricultural species, vegetal species, is in the, f in, in the forest uh, behind the field, not in the lab. We put zero value in that. We continue to deforest, zero value. So all of that, to summarize, is why we need uh, to rewrite economics. As simple as that. We are rewriting the code of finance to ensure that there will be a climate accounting, a nature accounting, a social accounting that recognizes the values, the costs, the capitals, basically, that companies are depending upon for their long-term success. If we succeed in doing this, uh, this will be fundamental because it's very clear that the capital markets are the best and absolutely necessary ally of public policy. So you need two things to do that. Public policies that show the direction, create the guardrails, and you need well-informed capital markets and finance because then if you do that, the companies that are better on biodiversity, climate resilience, etc., they will get money at a cheaper price from their bankers. It's as simple as that. Am I dreaming? No. Today already, the Financial Stability Board of the G20, which is all the governor banks, including the ECB, the, the European Central Bank, they are stress testing on climate the portfolio of lending of banks. What does that mean? They are looking at where this lending is going, which industry, and what is going to be the temperature of the emissions of those landing portfolios? If the temperature is too high, they will uh, price that risk. So the central bank will say, sorry, my friend, uh, you've got too much risk of climate change in your portfolio. I cannot land you at the base rate. I have to add, I don't know, 0 0.10. And that day, it becomes a competitive advantage for banks. It is not a fantasy. It is happening in tests and pilots as we speak now. 130 banks have done that this year in Europe. So this is moving. Now, the question that I have for you is, who believes that it will happen and that we can win that battle? Okay, so I think everyone said climate change is real. Everyone said we are responsible for it. And you're all, most of you are saying we're not going to make it. So I don't know why you're here. Not, not, not talking, sorry, what I mean by win is make this happen. I'll put it, yeah, let, let's, let's quantify. Who believe we can make 1.5 degree by the end of this century?
They are optimistic people. I love that. Who believes we can do um, 2.5? Yeah, okay. Let's call it a win, okay? Let's call it a win. The global stock take today is higher than this. Four degrees out of question, even for business reasons. The CEO of AXA 10 years ago said, four degrees, we cannot insure the world. A world at four degrees cannot be assured, insured. A world without insurance is, let's reinvent economics. Huh? Economics won't work without insurance. So let's call 2.5 a win. And that's my last point. That's about impact. We will win because of impact. And the question is, what can your impact be? Because things happen because of you, because of me, because of you know, all of us. They do not happen because the UN exists or because the Banque de France exists or because Sciences Po exists. You know, these are organizations. They are processing. But institutions are changed by people. The people, only the people make the difference. So my last comment, as I said, school and the three C's and climate, management, economics, we just discussed it, impact now. Impact is about you, as I just said. Um, first of all, I hope you will be successful we will be collectively successful. The question is, not the question, the worry is, for many, success when it comes with scale is creating something which I would love to, because I'm here, I've got nothing to lose or win, just share with you as a rule for your life. The more you will be successful, the more you will be seen as being successful, the more you will have money, the more you will have power, the more you will have glory. Whether you like it or not, it will happen. It, you, you don't need to be the CEO of uh, you know, one of the 10 largest companies in food in the world. You can find glory very close to your home. It is there. And I would really, really advise you, if you want to have impact, to stay free from these. Stay free. Stay free from money, addiction. Stay free from glory, from Instagram. Stay free from power, even. It's addictive. It's regressive. It's like a drug. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have them. They can be very, very powerful tool. Depends on what you're doing with that. But stay free. There is a French um, poet, André Gide, who says in French, tout ce que tu ne sais pas donner te possède. Vous voulez vivre. Vivre ou possédez-vous? Moi, je veux vivre libre. Libre, c'est ça qui m'intéresse. Fondamentalement, c'est ça. Stay free. Everything that you don't know how to give you don't know, it's too hard to give, possesses you. You will not have impact if you are possessed. You will have impact if you are free, because impact is never at the same place. It moves. It means you can't stay where you are. And those three things, they're making you stay where you are, believe that you've arrived somewhere. You never arrive somewhere. So if you pay attention to this, small rule of life. I think I would like to say there are three inner places that I would suggest that you constantly nurture within yourself. The first is never stay at the center of a circle of friends, of a country, of a group of people, of an institution. Nothing happens at the center. It's static. It's super comfortable. You're in the middle. <laughs> so comfortable. The frontiers are, you know, the others are far from you. We are together. Yes. 
so crazy. It's dead. When you approach a center, really think carefully how long you want to stay there. So stay always at the frontier. Stay at the frontier. This is where there is the friction. This is where the innovation comes. This is where you will meet people that see the world differently from you. You will learn from that. You will co-create with them. There's a French uh, sociologue called Michel Crozier who, uh, who described people that are sitting in the frontiers as marginal secant. I don't know how to say that in English. People that are not at the center, they are at the margin, they are sequent, means cutting. Why second? Because it means they are in the belonging of several circles, not just one. They are the limits of several circles. You know, where those circles are crossing. Civil society, politics, business, NGOs, I don't know. This is where, where you will have impact because this is where the new things are happening and then they are transforming the rest of the circle. So stay as close as possible to the frontier. They are staying there. It's not, it's not easy. It's much more difficult, much more fatigant at the end of the day than staying in the middle, you know, of course. But if you have impact, if you want in 10 years, in 20 years to remember that you raised your hand and saying, yes, we can win the 2.6, you have to be in the frontier, not stay in the center. The second one is about the fact that I would say by construct, you will have to move. You cannot stay at the same place. And that's a whole difference between power and leadership. Power is static. You receive power from an institution, from a board, from a government, from people that elect you, from I don't know what, you receive that power, you exercise that power in a mandate. That mandate is fixed. Use it, but look at it as well as a golden prison because it won't be moving. That's the difference with leadership. Referring to an interesting book I read a long time ago called Viviane Amar, She's a sociologue. She wrote something which was called power or leadership. And she was comparing the pharaohs sitting on big pyramids, not the physical pyramids, but the way they were organized. Uh, and uh, Moises, who took the Hebrew people out of Egypt, says the story. One has leadership. And he's moving. And then, then like for 40 years, they're wandering around in the desert. They have no idea where they are. And at the end of the day, he doesn't even reach the place. But at the end of the day, the people got out of Egypt. The other guys, they're sitting on their pyramids. And that's ultimately where the civilization died. So do you want to build pyramids? Or are you prepared to be nomadic? I'll tell you, leadership has no place to go, no place to stay. It's circulating. So if you want to be a leader, not just a powerful person, just make sure that you do not stay too long where you belong. Just make sure that you keep going. You keep going to some other places, uncomfortable places. Stay uncomfortable as much as possible. And the last thing is, um, with power, with money, with glory, there will be something coming with that. In French, we say compromission. In English, it's about compromise. You need to learn, experience deep in yourself the very thin limit that there is being between, sorry, making a compromise and being compromised. Qu'est-ce que c'est qu'un compromis? Et qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une compromission Where does your value, your values, your integrity as a person is at stake there That is being compromised. You know, like a software which is compromised, it doesn't work. You reach a point where it kills the software. It's very easy to lie to yourself because people will lie to you. The more power you will have, the more people will lie to you. And you will think about yourself as somebody else than you truly are. 
So make sure in the very difficult moments, the very difficult moments, that you stay true to your values, to who you are, who you want to be, really. And you always have to make compromises. If you are convinced about something and you believe everyone is convinced the same, it's easy, it's not hard. What is hard is to build something that is a deal. Yeah, we have a deal there, okay. So I have to you know, adjust a little bit what I think, what I would hope, my objectives. But yeah, we co-create that and it's better for the world. So I accept. I, do, I am not compromised. I'm actually growing through that because my conviction is then built with how the other person is actually thinking. It's different if you cross this invisible line and you are compromised. You do this because you're afraid. Don't be afraid. There's no reason to be afraid. If you are free, back to what I said, you will never need to be afraid. But then you will have to reconsider. If you feel that the decision is going to make you compromise, go away. This institution for which you work, it does not deserve you as a true person. And again, being compromised, you will not impact. Your impact will be negative. If you are compromised, if you stay true to who you are, that is the only way of having an impact in the very short, in the very long term, in the very short space around you, your family, your friends, your job, your office, uh, colleagues, and the much beyond world, and even generations for generations. So I will end up with that, but my call is stay free to these all the three things I just mentioned. It will allow you to nurture this thirst for being at the frontier, this thirst of moving to the next not exercising power that stays there, but really leadership to go forward with ultimately the best gift you can give to the world is to truly be yourself and become yourself. So go, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. I think, I think we could have listened to you for another hour very easily. We got more than extra financial accounting, but also lessons for life. Um, so if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. There are microphones on the sides. Yes, the gentleman here. I think you have to stand up and, and, and come over. You, yeah, and, and stand up and you can line up so that we can uh, have uh, the questions. No. No. Oui. It doesn't Français work. Anglais d'ailleurs. Merci. En français or in English, but with the mic. Does it work? No. Doesn't work yet? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, great. Thank It'll you. be in English if that's okay. Thank you, number one. Thank you so much for your speech. Incredible. Uh, I just had a question as we all become future managers. Uh, you were speaking about industries and how everything will be affected by climate change. Is there any industry or company today that is already at a good enough level in sustainability and climate change and in terms of preparation that we can look up to, mimic, or mirror as we become managers in different industries? Uh, before, can you just introduce yourself? So Sorry, you hi, I'm Eduardo. From? My name is Eduardo, I come from Canada. I'm in the uh, uh, communications and creative industries master. Okay. And it's very interesting because it's a very separate industry to be part of climate change, but you know, as everything will be impacted by it, I'm very curious if there's anything that's already at a high enough level uh, that we mm. can look up to. Mm. Thank you, Eduardo. Great question. Uh, the true simple answer is no. I, I think you can look up at experiences, bits and pieces of business models that companies are putting together, big and large and, or, or small. Huh? But as such, I don't think there is any climate resilient business model that I know that I would say the company is prepared. That's the model. I don't think so. 
There are bricks and pieces uh, all over the place. As a follow-up question, I was wondering if there's any area or location um, that you would recommend would be good for investment for factories that, you know, will be green enough uh, <laughs> or will not be affected by climate change. Uh, that would be a very long question, I think. Uh, answer, <laughs> sorry. And um, no. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. No, <laughs> sorry. So we have questions also upstairs. So we'll take one of each uh, in turn. Please go ahead and, and introduce <coughs> yourself, please. Try again. Do we need to switch the mic down? Maybe we take the question here? Exactly. So okay. wh while you fix it, please go ahead downstairs. Bonjour, monsieur. Je m'appelle Antoine. Je suis en master finance et stratégie à Sciences Po. Je parle en français. On va mélanger un peu. Mm -hmm. euh, alors, j'aurais une question, moi, enfin, deux questions plus particulièrement sur le travail que vous êtes en train de faire à l'ISSB ouais. et en particulier sur le, le groupe de normes IFRS S1 et S2 qui est sorti cet été en parallèle des normes SRS en Europe. Le, le, le gros manque Enfin, L'un des gros manques qui a été pointé dans, ce, dans, dans ces CFRS 1 et S2, c'est l'absence de double matérialité dans le reporting qui est demandé par les entreprises. Euh, ce principe est devenu un peu un standard de marche, enfin un standard de marche, progressivement implémenté euh, parmi les acteurs. Et ma question, c'est pourquoi euh, est-il manquant Et au vu de, de votre parcours, qui a plutôt été celui d'être forward-looking, d'être euh, pionnier sur ces segments, pourquoi est-ce que, comme, enfin, comment se fait-il qu'il a été oublié et mon deuxième point est sur la compétition qui est en train d'émerger entre, euh, enfin, entre d'une part, les IFRS S1 et S2 et de l'autre, les ESRS. Qu Est-ce enfin, voilà, est qu'on n'est pas en train de rater notre cible qui est d'avoir une approche commune sur ce, le front de l'ESG de Et euh, si oui, quelle est votre perspective sur ce sujet Merci. Et du coup, je vais le faire en français aussi. Euh, J'espère que vous allez en profiter pour améliorer votre français et surtout votre technique en matière de comptabilité. Euh, et je vais le faire néanmoins brièvement. Donc, euh, la matérialité euh, de marché financier, ça détermine en fait en quoi une information est importante pour la décision d'un investisseur et en quoi elle est susceptible d'influencer euh, les perspectives économiques de l'entreprise. Il y a une définition extrêmement claire, extrêmement claire, qui est utilisé depuis 30 ans dans les IFRS qui sont dans 140 pays en termes de comptabilité, euh, et qui est testé sur le marché tous les jours des milliards de fois. 400 milliards, trilli pardon, trilliards euh, de capitalisation boursière au total, equity et dette. Hein. Donc c'est testé des milliards de fois tous les mois. Ça, c'est le concept de matérialité au sens comptable du terme. Moi, je ne parle pas de matérialité financière, je parle de matérialité comptable. Ce que nous sommes chargés de créer au niveau mondial, euh, c'est le langage de l'économie du futur. Le langage économique, c'est la comptabilité. Euh, sans comptabilité, il n'y aurait pas d'économie. C'est aussi simple que ça, hein, puisqu'on ne saurait rien financer, puisque c'est au travers de la comptabilité qu'on exprime les perspectives économiques de l'entreprise. Ce qui manque aujourd'hui, c'est que dedans, il n'y a pas de climat, dedans, il n'y a pas de social, etc. etc. et c'est ça qu'on a commencé à, à construire. La notion de double matérialité est une notion euh, qui a été utilisée euh, en France euh, pour commencer, euh, en Europe ensuite, euh, autour de l'idée qu'on pourrait ajouter à cette matérialité euh, non seulement ce qui impacte l'entreprise, parmi lesquels ses impacts, bien sûr. Euh, nous, nous exigeons que les entreprises... Euh, euh, reportent sur leurs, effets, euh, leurs émissions de gaz à effet de serre en hein, périmètre 1, 2, direct, et puis tous les effets indirects également. Euh, c'est directement de l'impact, ça. C'est de l'impact qu'on a sur euh, les émissions de carbone dans des pays extrêmement lointains quand vous êtes une entreprise globale. Donc c'est vraiment que de l'impact. Et on demande pourtant qu'il soit là, parce qu'il est très clair que euh, c'est attaché à une décision d'investissement, parce qu'il y a attaché à ça des risques euh, qui peuvent être extrêmement importants pour euh, les investisseurs. L'idée de euh, la double matérialité, c'est en, en réalité de créer à côté de ça euh, des normes qui vont 
intéressait non pas les investisseurs, mais toutes les autres parties prenantes de l'entreprise. Donc euh, le gouvernement, des ONG, des associations de consommateurs, de la société civile, etc. Euh, je pense que c'est fondamental. Et d'ailleurs, on n'a pas attendu le concept de double matérialité pour faire des normes de reporting sur des sujets comme cela, hein, mais en France et ailleurs. Mais euh, par, je dirais, euh, commodité, euh, le terme de matérialité a, a été utilisé pour passer à double matérialité, mais c'est une euh, simplification, je dirais même c'est un simplisme, parce que il est impossible de dire que c'est une double matérialité en réalité, puisque qui peut dire comment décide une municipalité d'un côté, je ne sais pas, imaginez une pollution dans une, dans une petite mare, dans une municipalité. L'association de pêche locale est intéressée par un certain nombre de sujets. Euh, zut, cette pollution a tué les trois espèces préférées de ces pêcheurs. L'association de biodiversité, au contraire, elle, ce qui l'intéresse, c'est de savoir si, non pas ces trois espèces-là, mais toutes les autres, elles vont, elles vont survivre ou pas. Puis la municipalité, c'est combien, combien ça va coûter tout ça. À la limite, qu'il y ait 50 poissons ou 35, ça m'intéresse moyennement. Mais en revanche, savoir qui va payer et combien ça va coûter, ça, ça m'intéresse. Donc on voit très bien que dans cette idée, je pars d'une bonne intention, hein, de double matérialité, en réalité, déjà, juste sur ce point-là, il y en a probablement trois des matérialités. Et puis, par ailleurs, les politiques publiques ne sont pas évaluées chaque seconde comme le sont les marchés financiers. Il y a beaucoup de politiques publiques qui ne sont tout simplement jamais évaluées. C'est malheureux, mais c'est bien le cas. Quoi. Et donc, parler de matérialité, en l'occurrence, je pense que c'est vraiment un faux ami, en fait. On dit ça en, hein, un faux ami en, en français. Donc, je ne crois pas que la double matérialité existe. Euh, c'est un, un langage convenu qui a permis d'établir de façon un peu simple malheureusement, je pense, simpliste, et qui va entraîner des confusions et surtout euh, des désillusions. Euh, parce que la double matérialité est bien incapable euh, de mettre les entreprises sur la trajectoire de Paris, euh, des, des accords de Paris. J'entends des gens qui le prétendent, mais ce n'est juste, euh, juste pas le cas. Donc, je pense que c'est une étape intéressante, parce que c'est une étape dans laquelle, si on ne l'appelle pas double matérialité, mais qui est une matérialité économique et à côté un reporting euh, multipartie prenante, ça, ça me semble super intéressant, et c'est d'ailleurs pour ça qu'on a un accord mondial, vous disiez, ça a été oublié, non, nous, on a un accord mondial avec euh, Global Reporting Initiative, qui est euh, la seule euh, plateforme de reporting d'impact euh, au niveau mondial, pour dire euh, aux entreprises et aux gouvernements qui le souhaitent, vous pouvez prendre euh, les, euh, les standards euh, IFRS euh, Sustainability pour toute la partie économique et marché financier, et puis vous pouvez ajouter GRI, et avec ça, vous avez... Euh, une forme complète de, de, de reporting. Je pense que, au-delà de ça, j'arrête ce premier juste après, mais au-delà de ça, euh, je pense que ce concept d'un reporting plus complet, c'est très utile, c'est nécessaire. J'espère que ça va euh, en effet pousser au, au reporting de sujets qui sont importants, pas sur le plan économique, mais pour d'autres raisons. Je pense qu'il faut probablement utiliser un terme autre, parce que ça... Non, ce n'est pas du tout un standard de marché. Enfin, ça a été établi en Europe, mais euh, quand on discute dans le monde entier, ce n'est pas le cas. Euh, en revanche, il y a, je pense, un, un aspect très transformant et dans lequel on peut aller plus loin, qui est, nous, plutôt notre ligne de crête, c'est que, euh, comme je le décrivais tout à l'heure, une entreprise mobilise des capitaux qui sont différents, du capital naturel, du capital social, du capital humain, euh, du capital manufacturé, du capital financier, bien sûr. Et la question, c'est, est-ce euh, qu'on trouve un schéma... De, de, de valorisation qui permet de mesurer économiquement, mais économiquement, euh, l'évolution de ces différents capitaux et comment l'entreprise protège, euh, régénère ces capitaux. Et c'est pour ça qu'on a mis ce principe-là euh, tout en haut de la norme euh, S1, qui est notre norme fondamentale. Bon, je suis obligé de faire court, c'est une question euh, évidemment qui, euh, qui est importante, euh, mais je pense qu'on sera amené à en reparler dans les mois qui viennent, dans la clarification. Et pardon, après, sur la question de la concurrence, il n'y a pas de concurrence. L'Europe est en Europe, nous on travaille avec 140 pays, euh, ce qui est très important et qui a été réussi par euh, la Commission européenne, c'est qu'elle a, quand, euh, quand l'ISSB que je dirige a été créée, elle a demandé le raccordement entre les normes, et donc sur la norme climat en particulier, on est dans la substance à 95% identique aux normes européennes. Donc c'est plus une question de complémentarité et d'interopérabilité que de concurrence. Pardon. C'est vrai que la réponse était longue, mais la question méritait un tel eh ben développement. Je vais en rajouter peut-être oui. une petite couche, si ça ne vous oui, ennuie pas, puisque ce qui a été dit est vraiment 
important aussi dans un contexte où quand on voit l'évolution de la, de la façon dont on conçoit la norme statistique, non seulement comme une, pas seulement comme une norme technique, mais aussi comme quelque chose qui va cristalliser des valeurs, en fait, des, des, des valeurs au sens valorisation, mais aussi des valeurs euh, de, de civilisation, c'est absolument essentiel. Et de fait, en parallèle, en parallèle de tous ces exercices sur la compatibilité d'entreprise, il y a aussi les statisticiens, les instituts nationaux de statistique, par le biais de, de, des Nations Unies essentiellement, qui sont en train, depuis plusieurs années, euh, de travailler sur les concepts de comptabilité nationale. Et la comptabilité nationale, ça date, alors euh, le, le prémisse, c'était dans les années 30, mais vraiment de l'après-guerre. Et on a besoin aussi de remettre sur le, le métier toutes ces normes comptables qui comptabilisent de l'activité de marché, mais aussi de l'activité hors marché et qui nous donnent finalement la mesure du, du PIB. Donc ces efforts sont vraiment euh, ouais. du volant à l'autre. Ouais, ouais. Et, et j'ajoute, la comptabilité nationale, les comptabilités nationales sont très, très en retard sur la comptabilité euh, économique, hein, pour des raisons qui sont liées à ce que je viens de dire, c'est-à-dire les, les, les politiques publiques sont rarement, euh, sont, sont, sont rarement évaluées. Euh, et quand on voit aujourd'hui, bah, je le disais, enfin, le, le PIB pour guider la, tra la, la transition euh, euh, climatique et sociale, c'est un outil extrêmement fruste. Euh, appeler croissance du PIB euh, croissance, c'est un sujet dont on peut parler. Quoi. Il y a vraiment à boire et à manger dans le PIB. C'est pareil quand on compte la dette sur le PIB, par exemple. La, la dette française est une dette qui est incroyablement bien structurée sur le plan technique. Elle a une, une qualité de papier au sens marché du terme qui est incroyable, parmi les meilleurs au monde. Euh, mais les critères de dette nationale sont des critères de dette brute. Euh, dans n'importe quelle entreprise, vous prenez la dette, vous dites ben, « j'ai de la trésorerie, hein, j'ai de l'argent là dans mon bas de laine, puis de l'autre côté, je dois de l'argent. » Quand je parle de ma dette, je parle de l'un moins l'autre. Là, non. En compta public, on parle juste de la dette brute. On ne se dit pas, tiens, d'un autre côté, euh, l'État possède plein, plein de choses. Donc, il y a énormément de choses, et Natacha a complètement raison, à, à rénover, rénover d'urgence, euh, compte tenu de l'urgence climatique, mais la Cour des comptes y travaille, d'autres, etc. Et il y a même un organe qui s'appelle euh, IPCSB, qui est euh, l'International Public Sector Accounting Standard Board, euh, qui vient de décider de prendre les normes IFRS S1 et S2 plus GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, pour fonder, euh, pour créer la fondation du futur système de normes du, compte, du, du, du secteur public dans le monde. Alors vous êtes au bon endroit dans cette école parce qu'il y a trois ans de ça maintenant, on a eu l'initiative Luca Pacioli euh, qui, qui a rassemblé M. de Cambourg à l'époque, enfin c'était les grands acteurs, Nicolas Stern était là pour justement aborder ces choses-là et les instiller dans ce que vous allez apprendre à l'école. Donc vous allez bientôt avoir des labels Pacioli sur certains cours qui, se, qui feront écho à tout ce qu'on est en train de dire maintenant. Je donne la parole aux étudiants en haut, s'ils peuvent vous présenter. Merci. Ça fonctionne maintenant, merci. Monsieur Faber, merci pour votre speech. Vous avez parlé à nous sur les sujets et les sociaux et c'est à ce sujet et comme ex-CEO de Danone que je vous demande cette question. Vous avez montré une grande force, dans mon opinion, en transformant Danone en une société à mission et en faisant beaucoup de challenges dans cette histoire. Mais je n'ai jamais entendu parler d'une des plus profitables branches de Danone, qui est le segment de la bouteille de bouteille de bouteille de bouteille de bouteille de bouteille de bouteille. Uh, branch, which is the bottled water segment, uh, and symbolizes an industry that, for my generation, is not really understandable. Um, as you said, we're all prisoners of geography, and I can understand Danon mm -hmm. having like bottled water in countries uh, like Mexico, for example, because water there isn't drinkable, uh, the tap water. However, it isn't really acceptable um, to our generation anymore in countries where water is drinkable. How can we understand the ecological and social externalities of brands like Evian and, and Badois? We emit so much greenhouse gas for no other added value than plastic, because in the end, Danone only sells plastic. Um, and you've talked about the droughts, and this water, uh, in the end, belongs to the local communities. Um, maybe today you'll be able to talk more freely than before. Um, maybe uh, you regret not being able to change more of Danone's culture regarding bottled water when you were CEO. Thank you very much for your answer. Merci pour la question. Um, thank you. you. You didn't introduce yourself. Excusez-moi, je n'ai pas bien compris la réponse. Vous, vous ne vous êtes pas présenté, pardon. Ah, euh, Jean Cotte, je suis en finance et stratégie. Merci. So, um, there's, there's absolutely no doubt that uh, the water industry is both a strategic and challenging one at the same time. Um, as you exactly pointed to, if you think about Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, India, etc., etc., 
uh, you cannot drink tap water. So there is no question there. Um, at least in the short term, because, no, sorry, there's no question, because in those countries, there will most likely not be the investment made in order to turn tap water into uh, a drinkable solution. Um, cities in total, I think, cover about 1% of the planet, and yet 75% of uh, the people, and therefore there's no doubt that you will have to have water traveling to those cities in order to, as I was describing for Chennai in, uh, in India, for instance, in order to ensure that people have water to drink. Um, tap water is a solution, but is not always a good solution. Uh, tap water has its own drawbacks. Uh, the pipes in Europe are super old. The speed at which they are replaced uh, with big leaks, leaks that are anywhere between 10 to 30% in the pipes of distribution of uh, drinkable water in Europe. Um, if you look at the big companies and how much they invest, it will take about 200 years before those leaks are fixed. Um, pollution in tap water is not an easy issue either and consumers are more and more demanding. Um, and finally, when you, I was mentioning uh, one, uh, no, I didn't actually, as um, the consumption of uh, tap water in France is 150 or 180 liters per day per person. You only drink one to 2% of that. So basically you are treating water to make it drinkable, uh, but 90%, 98% of it, is actually not, it's going in the toilets, in the shower, in the garden, in the washing of the car, everything else. So I would say in and by itself, the water industry is difficult. Now, if you think about those brands like Evian and others, I think you need to think about two things. One is uh, the, the protection of the spring water itself. You're talking about the communities, it's absolutely the case. In Evian, since 1992, there is a general agreement with uh, all the municipalities that are around, all the farmers that are on the catchment area to share the value. Th that has been done. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's, it's done and it's absolutely essential. And that was also one of the reasons why this business continues to, to flourish. Now, if you ask me, first of all, you said, maybe you can talk more freely. Would you say I wasn't free after what I said earlier? So what I'm sharing, what, what I'm saying to you now is exactly, Matthias is there, is exactly what I was saying when I was at uh, the height of Danon. I don't think the business model of exporting plastic bottles on the other side of the planet is sustainable. And I have done my small part, as you exactly said, not enough, my small part to redirect those two different ways. We've also looked at a lot of different ways of Packaging without plastics, packaging in big jugs, packaging in all kinds of solutions, uh, machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but yeah, that is a very, very long story. Having said all of that, you said it's a very profitable. It's absolutely no profits. There is no no money made on Avion at all. If you if you think about and and for a long time already, eh? especially because when you sell a bottle of Avion at 15 cents in Leclerc, you don't make any money. Especially when you pay your employees. Uh, 14 months of salary and all the benefits. I'm not complaining in any way. I'm just saying uh, it may have been a profitable business long time ago. It's a very small business now compared to the size of Danone. It is not a profitable one, but your question is the right one. Thank you for asking it. Thank you. Uh, Mademoiselle, ensuite upstairs, monsieur, et on alterne comme ça. Uh, Alexandra speaking. Uh, my question is very simple and hard at the same time uh, because you seem very optimistic during your speech. So I was wondering um, how do you keep sane? <laughs> because sometimes I'm losing mine and I don't think I'm the only one here. What, what is your name again? Sorry. Alexandra. Alexandra. Thank you, Alexandra. So. Um, I'm also, uh, you know, there are really moments where uh, I feel the pressure because now sort of the, the face-off between finance and climate is all of my professional life. 
So day and night, weekends, everything. That's what I have from China to the US and you know, France, etc. cetera. Um, I, I'm not Superman. So I also have my moments where I feel down. Um, last summer was really difficult for me, you know, with all the droughts, the fires all over the place, those, you know. And so, yeah, I have also my moments of anxiety. So what I do first is, Matthias told that, I'm climbing. I'm an avid climber. I, I cannot live and breathe without climbing. So to find this safe place, this safe moment, where as uh, the Zen Buddhist would say, you're home, you've arrived, you're, you're safe there. There can be fire, wars, whatever, inside you're safe. My way of reconnecting is climbing. Because when, cli when I climb, at least, I cannot, my mind cannot be somewhere else. My body cannot be somewhere else. My soul needs to be in the intent. So I'm totally unified with that moment and that place, only the rock and the gravity and the air and me and a good friend with a rope. And so I would really encourage you to find your ways. At, at, at the worst of the climate, of, of the crisis of Danone with the activists and all the like, I was gonna climb. I was gonna climb during the lockdown, etc. I was climbing, that's, that's my way of staying myself. And, and when I go down, I'm just regenerated. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to find your own ways. It can, you know, it can be anything. It can be music, it can be you know, painting, it can be you know, friends, whatever. But find this safe place, absolutely. OK, thanks. It's, it's getting late. So I think we'll take one last round of questions. So three questions, one here, one here, one here. And that will be it. Uh, you've given us already a lot of your time. So please be, be quick and... Uh Bonsoir, Monsieur Faber. Euh, je m'appelle Alexis, je suis étudiant au Master Finance et Stratégie, mais je suis avant tout juriste en droit des entreprises en difficulté et j'ai une question d'ordre très pratique à vous poser pour l'avenir. Euh, pour faire un petit point, un petit rappel de... Enfin, contextualiser ma question, mmh. un des points soulevés par euh, Jean-Marc Jancovici dans la faillite d'entreprise, c'était que le problème de la transition énergétique et du plan de transformation de l'économie française, c'était la place des salariés dans leurs entreprises. En France, notre priorité, c'est la sauvegarde de l'emploi, le paiement des créanciers, le maintien de l'entreprise. Mais demain, il y aura un véritable enjeu qui est euh, la viabilité des entreprises vis-à-vis euh, -vis de la crise climatique. Euh, pour traiter les entreprises en difficulté, on s'inspire, enfin, on a absolument besoin d'une comptabilité très précise et opérationnelle pour savoir si celle-ci est viable ou non. Demain, dans, votre, dans les normes que vous proposez, proposerez-vous des normes techniques harmonisées ou une collaboration avec les administrateurs et mandataires judiciaires de France et de Navarre pour, euh, pour aider ces professionnels ainsi que des non-juristes ou même des, des, des non-comptables ouais. à appréhender, savoir si une entreprise sera viable grâce aux normes que vous proposez. Merci beaucoup. Oui, c'est super. Euh... Ah, vous, on prend les trois on Oui, prend pardon, bien sûr. Ouais, okay, non, c'est la dernière. Oui, bien sûr, bien sûr. Oui. Monsieur Non, mademoiselle. Oui, pardon. vous m'entendez Oui. Euh, bonsoir. Moi, j'ai une petite question par rapport à la valeur de la nature. Vous avez dit qu'aujourd'hui, il n'y en a pas. Pourtant, il y a des tentatives, notamment via les services écosystémiques. Euh, alors, au-delà du débat éthique de savoir si on peut réduire la nature à ses contributions aux populations, est-ce que vous pensez que c'est une approche qui est fiable malgré le manque de connaissances Si on pense par exemple aux insectes, comment est-ce qu'on peut donner une valeur à quelque chose qu'on ne connaît pas euh, Et si du coup les, approches, les services écosystémiques ne sont pas une approche fiable, quelle approche, vous, d'un point de vue comptable, euh, vous pouvez euh, considérer à l'avenir Merci. 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 Je vous en prie. Bonsoir. Um ma question sera plus générale euh, c'est sur la définition d'une entreprise à impact euh, comment est-ce que vous définiriez une entreprise à impact est-ce que c'est une entreprise qui a vraiment un but pragmatique et euh, bah, qui s'adapte finalement aux circonstances au contexte macroéconomique ou est-ce que c'est une entreprise qui a des valeurs et qui reste, enfin, on va dire des valeurs sociétales qui met la société en avant et qui reste quoi qu'il arrive fidèle à ces valeurs là merci, merci. je vais les prendre dans l'ordre alors euh, sur la question des administrateurs judiciaires la réalité, je pense, pour faire court, c'est que c'est peu probable parce que euh, les, la capacité d'une entreprise à s'adapter ou à développer des solutions en face du changement climatique, euh, elle nécessite le long terme. Enfin, les changements ne sont pas de nouveau juste pour demain. Quoi. Donc je pense que ce qu'on va, qu va faire va en revanche mettre en avant des risques qui sont invisibles aujourd'hui, mais des risques qui sont plutôt de l'ordre de... Euh, 
5 ans, 10 ans, parfois 3 ans, 1 an, mais pas des risques à la semaine, à la semaine prochaine. Et donc, Alors, je vais peut-être ouais. nuancer ma question, ouais. mais pour être plus précis, c'était de savoir, est-ce que vous fournirez des outils pour savoir si une entreprise est plus bien pour être redressée ou est-ce qu'il vaudrait mieux la liquider et favoriser le replacement des salariés dans d'autres entreprises C'était plus une question une fois qu'on se retrouve face à une situation catastrophique d'entreprise en difficulté, plus que sur l'avenir. D'accord. Donc, bah, je pense que la, euh, le bout de réponse, c'est l'économie ne, ne se transformera pas s'il n'y a pas non plus une transformation des emplois. Donc la question, c'est en quoi non plus les actifs de l'entreprise au sens comptable du terme, mais ces actifs humains euh, sont euh, adaptés là où ils en sont euh, aux métiers d'avenir de concurrents ou d'autres filières. Moi, je pense qu'en effet, il euh, y, y a une probabilité, comment dire, chaque pays, en fonction de son avantage concurrentiel déformé par le climat, devra définir des politiques de transition juste sur les, la transition écologique et sur les aspects sociaux, dans les aspects sociaux, il y a la question de euh, qu'est-ce qu'on fait des salariés qui ne seront plus concernés par des activités qu'on va éliminer, bien entendu. Et donc, dans ce cadre-là, on saura évidemment euh, quels sont les emplois dits d'avenir et qui permettront sans doute euh, une grille de lecture de plus sur euh, l'avenir des salariés dans l'entreprise. Est-ce qu'ils continuent à faire un truc qui, de toute façon, est voué à sa perte sur le plan économique du terme ou est-ce qu'on les extrait et on les met dans un... Euh, dans un contexte euh, de travail, euh, dans une entreprise dont l'avenir est assuré et, au, et, et avec quel coût de formation marginale entre les deux pour le faire. C'est des questions, nous, qu'on s'est posées très, très clairement dans des plans de réorganisation euh, chez Danone. Euh, D'autres entreprises ont commencé à le faire, mais il va falloir le faire absolument massivement à l'échelle des pays, hein, euh, sur cette question-là précise. Voilà, merci. Sur la question des services écosystémiques et de la comptabilité, moi, euh, pragmatiquement, euh, un, oui, évidemment, on, peut, on ne peut pas limiter la valeur de la nature à sa valeur dite économique et au service qu'elle nous rend. Mais si, pour commencer, on pouvait commencer par euh, euh, les, les comptabiliser euh, dans euh, les impacts négatifs des activités économiques quand elles réduisent la biodiversité ou au contraire les impacts positifs quand cette biodiversité sert l'économie comme elle le fait chaque fois que les insectes pollinisent des arbres par exemple, je pense que ce serait un très très bon début. C'est pas, enfin, pas très compliqué conceptuellement. Et ensuite il y a la question de la méthode. Euh, moi j'y crois tellement que j'ai pris une conseillère spéciale qui est euh, la patronne de l'économie bleue à la Banque mondiale qui rédige pour la Banque mondiale depuis euh, des années euh, les, euh, les rapports que la Banque mondiale émet sur l'évolution du capital naturel, hein, euh, en valorisant en effet. Donc je pense vraiment que l'approche de valorisation économique euh, des services naturels et de la nature est fondamentale pour l'évolution des marchés financiers. Ce ne sera pas nécessairement suffisant pour tout faire, mais pour cette évolution-là, c'est fondamental. Et évidemment, au fur et à mesure, les méthodologies vont se s'affiner, se, euh, se réduire, euh, se normaliser. Il y, a, il y a 10 ans de boulot de ce côté-là. Hein. Voilà. Sur la question de l'entreprise à impact, euh, une entreprise euh, qui cesse d'être une entreprise n'a plus d'impact. Et donc, quand vous dites une entreprise qui conserverait euh, contre vents et marées son impact, même si le, au point de euh, fragiliser, voire détruire euh, le modèle économique, elle disparaît. Et donc la question, c'est est-ce euh, qu'on a bien pris en compte tous les impacts, y compris celui, par exemple, de, je sais pas, de représenter 10 000 emplois dans un bassin d'emploi et je sais pas quoi. Donc je, ce qui me semble important, c'est au fur et à mesure de la vie de l'entreprise, d'être en permanence en train de nouveau de ne pas s'arrêter à se dire on a défini euh, euh, notre approche de l'impact et c'est ça et c'est figé mais d'être constamment en train de le revoir, parce que la réalité, c'est que le métier de l'entreprise et ses enjeux changent au fur et à mesure. Euh, voilà, donc j'aurai une approche assez euh, pragmatique sur ce sujet. Merci. Merci. Merci Emmanuel Faber. Merci à tous. Bonne route dans la vie, les amis. On a de la chance de vous avoir avec nous. Salut.